and welcome to this edition of Energy Frontiers. And we say thank you to the African Energy Chamber for the support of the show. I am your host, Justina Okechuku. And let's get started with some of the biggest energy news from here in Africa and around the world. Kenya hosted the first ever Africa Climate Summit in the week, bringing together Africa and other world leaders, including experts, industry operators, and civil society organizations. The three-day summit proposed a new architectural reform that would ensure to make green energy investment a priority. Highlights of the Nairobi summit include the release of a report on the financing clean energy in Africa, jointly authored by the International Energy Agency and the African Development Bank. You can get details of that report online. The Africa Climate Summit ended with various calls to action, resounding messages for significant interventions and a total of $23 billion in commitments to support various climate mitigation efforts across the African continent. In the meantime, the African Energy Chamber has called on the African Union to align its policies with Africa's demand and embrace both gas and nuclear energy as green solutions in line with the European Union's July 2022 announcement, which labeled both commodities as green sources of energy. Away from the Kenya Climate Summit, Saudi Arabia and Russia in the week announced the extensions of their voluntary production cuts, totaling some 1.3 million barrels per day through to December of this year. Those announcements rallied oil prices to over $90 per barrel for the London Brent crude. The West African country of Niger has announced an increase in its price of uranium from 0.80 euros to 200 euros per kilogram. This was a major step that is set to affect the outlook of the global uranium market. Niger Republic, a crucial player in the industry, says the price increase was a bold step towards securing a fair compensation for its invaluable natural resources. Now, oil and gas drilling services company KCA Dutag has won a one-year contract extension worth $60 million dollars which will allow the company to deliver core drilling operations and maintenance services on two offshore platforms in Angola. And that was a snapshot of your energy news headlines. When we return, we'll circle back to one of the key highlights of the inaugural Africa Climate Summit. <music> energy frontiers. Now, the just-concluded Africa Climate Summit featured a number of high-level panel discussions that spotlighted the pivotal roles of innovation, governance, and partnerships in unlocking climate finance. One of such discussions was a panel hosted by AfriCatalyst, a causal tenancy group. The panelists highlighted the need for adequate financing flows to implement climate adaptation and mitigation policies in the African continent. Frontier Africa reports was on the ground at the summit and sent this in. Um, ju just to um, summarize many ways of determining how we can finance climate and development. So first, the, there is that approach that uh, Vera just mentioned about um, 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 which is a deductionist approach of the, uh, of the numbers. It's a bit complicated, but uh, it comes from determining um, that we need to double finance for development at large. So we, um, there is a gap of around $5.3 trillion uh, dollars, um, that need to be uh, required. Half of that would, uh, are required for climate-related um, funding around 2.4 trillion. 
I think uh, Dr. Mahmoud actually already started talking about uh, the partnerships that we have created in the last year, um, especially as we were building the UN Compendium of Climate Action Projects. And uh, the work that uh, started at the Africa Regional Forum, which was a partnership between uh, our team, UNEC, uh, led to several initiatives, including the Africa Carbon Markets uh, uh, Initiative, which is a partnership with GEP and and SE for all, and now with Rockefeller. And uh, similarly, we have another partnership with uh, AFDB uh, on the Africa Climate Risk Facility and yourselves at ARC. So I certainly think that there's an appetite for partnerships, uh, and there can be a lot of progress that will be achieved with partnerships. And uh, what is clear is that we, you know, there, there is... Uh, a need for uh, consolidation uh, for teams like ours that are smaller, agile, to use their platforms and to use their agility to drive greater progress with uh, bigger institutions like the uh, AFDB. And one of the things that we've seen that has benefited from a partnership between a smaller, uh, faster entrepreneurial team. The way we have structured uh, the Alliance for Green Infrastructure in Africa is really in line with how the partnerships should be done to mobilize climate finance at scale. We are looking at the entire value chain or the life cycle of a project. F number one, you need the upstream work from the governments to set the right planning, the right vision, the right strategies to make sure that you have the nationally determined contribution and to make sure that with the money is available, project preparation money is available for the government, so it's a grant resource to allow them to do the upstream work that is required to identify a list of projects that will meet the ambitions of the country. And for that, we are raising $100 million of grant resources from donor countries from uh, the philanthropy and co. So this is the role of donor countries and philanthropy within this partnership. And then you move to the second phase, which is the development phase, where you have identified your projects, you know your priorities, and you need now to work with the private sector to develop those projects at scale, to de-risk them, to do all the studies, to hire a consultant, to do the drilling, to do all the difficult work that a private investor may not want to do alone. So we are saying, let's raise a $400 million uh, blended finance facility that will co-invest with private developers. The development is not done by the governments, it's done by the developers in partnership with the governments. And once you have developed all those projects, then you move to the project financing to make sure that you're going to reach financial close. And for that, you need the DFIs, you need the external investors, the private equity, because it's where you need to put in risky money, equity. On a de-risk project, you put in equity, you want returns, but you don't work alone, you raise debt from the DFIs, from commercial banks, from everybody. But then also you need some guarantees to make sure that you know, the private sector is comfortable. If you have an off-taker in a country where the utility is not credit worthy, someone has to step in and say if the utility will pay. And if the government is weak, unfortunately we have many of them that are not very credit worthy as well. Another institution that is more credit worthy like the African Development Bank will step in and say if the government fails to pay, then I will come and pay. Suddenly the private sector is comfortable, this project will go to financial close. I could not emphasize more, having been in government, the role of the government. If you don't have the right, the vision, the planning, and the competent skills within government, it's expensive to hire competent skills in government. In Senegal, the way we resolved that problem was that we convinced the MasterCard, MasterCard Foundation out of Toronto to give us a facility for us to hire very smart, competent, experienced people that was in my cabinet in the different departments driving the reforms in Senegal. This is how we did the PPP reform in a record time. Within six months, 
with the reforms of the PPP entirely revamped within six months for something that would have taken Senegal three to four years. And that was because we had people dedicated. We had also a president that was driven. Our president was chairing himself the technical sessions. We would have six to nine hours meetings chaired by the president going through this PPP reforms line by line and arguing. The politicians want this, the technical people want that to make sure that the private sector will find our PPP framework are very actually uh, attractive. So it, it, the rating issue is a very important one. Uh, and we need to find ways of uh, addressing that. Um, we are owned by African governments. So the rating agency says you can't have a rating that is higher than your shareholders. That was the starting point. Uh, but we have engaged them. So now we have a rating that is higher than the average of our shareholders. Um, so they, you can engage, we can set up our own uh, to influence the um, cost of funding, which is very important. But I do agree with the views that uh, my fellow panelists have, uh, have raised uh, in terms of how do we accelerate um, finance into the continent. As African Export-Import Bank, we have done a number of things. One was to ensure that as an institution we were fit for purpose, mm -hmm. uh, we could attract capital through our rating. So we improved our rating. We are now rated A minus uh, and triple B plus by other rating agencies. But we've also increased our capital base. Uh, so we now have adequate capital. So we thank our African shareholders for putting money into the institution. So we can do more. But above that, we have looked at uh, the issue of lack of bankable projects. Mm. So we have established a project preparatory fund four years ago um, by ourselves. And so far, we have enabled about $6 billion uh, worth of projects. Mm. But we noticed that it's not enough uh, to do it by ourselves. So we've attracted eight other financial institutions mostly from the continent, actually. Even smaller institutions like Nigerian Exim Bank, uh, like uh, Bank of Industry. So eight other institutions have joined us in what we call a joint project preparatory fund, uh, which will then uh, enable us to take the early uh, risk. But we also recognize that there is not enough grants out there. There is not enough of the philanthropic life funds coming into the continent. So our shareholders at the last annual general meeting said, why don't you put your money first so that you can attract others to focus on concessional financing. Digging for more from that panel, Frontier Africa Reports producer Stephen Owo caught up with Dennis Denya, the Executive Vice President of Finance Administration and Banking Services at the Africa Export Import Bank. Listen now to Denya as it tells Stephen Owar how a present bank uses its financial resources and expertise to support climate finance in Africa. No, it's, it's a very important question. Um, Africa has had people speak on its behalf in terms of what it requires, what is needed in terms of climate financing. Uh, so having a, a summit where African leaders come and come up with an African position is very, very important because uh, if we don't do that, other people will assume things for us uh, which will not be beneficial uh, for us. There are well-meaning um, NGOs out there but who don't have knowledge, who don't have our interest at heart. So it is, this is very important. As we approach COP28, it is important to come up with an African position. Uh, thank you so much uh, for mentioning that, uh, that we need to, what I hear from that is that uh, as a, an African continent, we need to come up with homegrown solutions yeah. to challenges that face us. Now, maybe just to come back to the bank, African Bank, where you are the vice president, how is the bank using its financial resources and expertise to support climate finance in the continent? Yeah, at African Bank, we recognize obviously the impact of uh, climate change. Our focus is on how do we enable Africans to adapt? Because 
climate change is here. People are actually suffering because of the impact of uh, climate change. So how do we enable our member countries, our clients to adapt? So that's our focus as African Export Import Bank. And we do this by looking at countries individually. Uh, for example, here in Kenya, we engaged with the government and they said, look, we have water challenges. So how do we ensure that there is water availability? for communities and citizens. So we have earmarked $800 million for climate adaptation for Kenya, which we are going to implement. But we've gone further than that and looked at the continent itself and said, look, how do we enable Africa to adjust? If we implement the FCTA as intended, meaning that we trade more amongst ourselves than with the rest of the world. So improve on the current 16% uh, in the Africa trade, meaning we create more jobs here, we move goods less distances than we currently do, uh, we add value to our commodities so that you generate more in terms of exports. So you generate more for financing client resilient projects on the continent. So we do that. We also play an advocacy role. We engage with the African Union, we engage with the AFCTA, we are a partnership organization. Uh, so it's from advocacy, providing our own money, um, making sure that we take a holistic approach to climate change. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And I'm glad that you brought in the AFCFTA protocol uh, into the conversation. Now, from the bank's point of view, how can the continent leverage uh, this very important protocol to actually decarbonize? There are, there are a number of ways uh, we can do this. One is to reduce the transportation of raw materials out of the continent, bring the finished goods here. So that in itself uh, is a decarbonization. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, but it is important for governments to ensure that the FCTA protocols have legal effect in their countries, uh, give effect to the rules of origin, um, so that we increase intra-Africa trade and raise the economic development of our continent. Uh, th thank you so much for that. And just to, to my next question, how does the bank uh, you know, ensure that the funds that you disperse for adaptation and climate change is actually used effectively and prudently by you know, the nations that uh, you, know, you advance it to? Yes, as you might know, we don't do budget support. We finance projects. So the government comes to us and says, we have these projects for adaptation. We evaluate each project. Uh, we do proper due diligence and then we finance directly to that project and have monitoring mechanism or when it's implemented. So we avoid the diversion of funds. Uh, we do that not only with sovereigns, but with our borrowing clients who are in the private sector as well. Okay. And just, just to my last question, I mean, uh, what, maybe just give us a glimpse into what sort of uh, projects are on the table uh, as far as uh, climate change is concerned from a bank's point of view uh, going into the future. Yeah. Um, we finance the Rufiji Dam in Tanzania. Uh, which dealt with uh, both the flooding issue and the scarcity issue. Uh, we are promoting the battery precursor projects between Zambia and DRC, which is, means we are adding value to the cobalt, the lithium, and produce uh, battery precursors. What we are doing at the moment is promote uh, export processing zone between those two countries, so that we can export value added. But we are going beyond that, because we are looking at what are the minerals that are essential in the EV value chain. Yes. Uh, and so, if we are going to produce electric vehicles, electric motorcycles, which countries, so that you know everyone benefits from the FCTA, um, look at the entire value chain. So what can South Africa do? What can Zambia do? What can Nigeria do? So that people look at it and see it's creating value for them. So these are the kind of projects we are pursuing.
Imagine a future where tomorrow's solutions build a world of opportunities for all and where human potential is truly realized. Where every child has an equal chance in life, no matter where they were born. Imagine the potential of a continent built on low carbon oil and natural gas and abundant renewable energy. Imagine Mozambique, Angola, Nigeria, Uganda, Senegal, Egypt, Namibia and Algeria being let free to develop their natural resources without pressure from wealthy countries to leave it in the ground. Imagine an Africa where we cut red tape bureaucracy and provide better fiscal terms so we can compete globally for energy investments. African Energy Week is the African Energy Chamber's annual event held at the Cape Town waterfront, uniting African energy leaders, global investors and executives from across the public and private sector for four days of intense dialogue on the future of the African energy industry. Showcasing the latest technologies and innovations to 5,000 plus registered delegates from over 100 countries and international professionals from across the global energy sector. Be part of the future of the energy industry and join the energy movement by becoming an official sponsor, exhibitor, delegate or partner. African Energy Week wrap up the show. The African Energy Chamber has endorsed an agreement between O and O PLC and Italian oil giant ENI and has asked the Nigerian government to speed up the approval process for the acquisition of the shares of the Nigerian Ajib Oil Company Limited by O and O. The executive chairman of the African Energy Chamber, NJ Ayuk, said in a statement that by increasing Oando's stake in vital oil and gas assets and infrastructure, the agreement will not only strengthen indigenous control, but also contribute to increased economic development within the West African country. Now, the road to the biggest energy industry summit in Africa is still open. Remember to sign up and attend the African Energy Week 2023 due in Cape Town, South Africa on October 16 to 20. And that's how we drop the curtain on Energy Frontiers this week. Thank you everyone for watching. Don't forget to follow the show on Frontier Africa Reports website. Subscribe to our YouTube and follow us across all our social media handles as indicated on the screen. I am Justina Okechukwu. I'll see you soon.